Welcome to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen, and in today's episode, we'll talk about a digital euro. In the last two episodes, we've talked about the impact of digitalization on jobs and how it transforms the way we work. But it's not just that. Digitalization has spread to every corner of our lives. It affects how we live, how we consume and interact with each other. It also affects how we pay. More and more people are paying with cards, phones, watches, rings, and there's some evidence that the coronavirus pandemic has accelerated contactless payment means and other forms of paying. Now, currently when you pay like that, you're interacting with money in your bank account or on your credit card. But what if you could have the digital equivalent of a banknote or coin? Earlier this month, the ECB released a report on exactly this question the possibility of a central bank digital currency, the digital euro. With me here today is Ulrich Binsal, who's responsible for market infrastructures and payments here at the ECB. Thanks a lot for joining us, Ulrich. Thanks, Michael, for inviting me. Uh, Ulrich, you were part of this high-level task force uh, with representatives from national central banks from across the euro area who wrote the report. But before we get into the detail on that, I think it's probably important to touch very briefly again on this big topic of what is money um, and here I think it's important that we talk about two particular classifications and that is central bank money uh, which is currently essentially banknotes as far as most people are concerned right the only way you or I really touch so-called central bank money is if we have a banknote and then everything else which is commercial money and that's basically all the money on our bank accounts uh, whenever we make a, a payment uh, electronically at the moment and that that also is effectively um, issued by uh, the bank where our account is. Can you just talk us through the, the those differences and, and what the difference between those two categories is? Yeah, sure, Michael. Um, if we look uh, today at how we use the two forms of money, we can again, you know, distinguish the, the three uh, functions of money. So unit of account, as mentioned, comes uh, from the central bank as a store of value we can observe that uh, commercial bank money really uh, dominates. So 90% of total money is uh, commercial bank money. The stocks of banknotes are much lower, uh, around 10% of what we hold with our commercial banks as a side deposits in particular. So overwhelmingly what's out there is commercial money. But then if we, talk to, if we start talking about uh, digital currencies and specifically a digital euro, are we then talking about a kind of digital equivalent of a of a banknote. Uh, yeah, that's a good uh, simple definition. Um, but uh, let me distinguish the three functions of money briefly. You know, unit of account is given by the central bank today. It's not given by a precious metal coin or whatever as it was in the past. Store of value, we can say that commercial bank money by far dominates central bank money because uh, people you know hold much higher deposits with their banks, side deposits in particular, which are around 10 times what we hold in uh, bank notes. Uh, but the third function is uh, the means of payment function of money. And here still we have a predominance of bank notes of cash relative uh, to commercial bank money, which uh, we typically use uh, for payment in the form of cards or related payment solutions. So there we have, uh, in terms of uh, value of payments, currently an equivalence between the two, or it may be that card payments have just overtaken uh, cash payments in terms of uh, value. In terms of volumes, um, in shops uh, in the euro area, there's still 75% of payments take uh, the form of cash and only 25% uh, of uh, in the form of cards and of course in other u uh, payment um, usages the uh, electronic payments commercial bank money payments have been predominating for a long time for example when uh, firms uh, pay their supplier pay their employees pay taxes they always pay electronically in a uh, commercial bank money uh, if we come now to the definition again of uh, digital euro, I mean, as you put it, it is uh, banknotes in electronic forms and uh, in the sense that banknotes have been accessible to all of us. Every firm, every citizen, even every foreigner can uh, hold euro banknotes. There are no uh, restrictions. 
while electronic central bank money so far could be held only by commercial banks in the form of uh, deposits with the central bank and um, a so-called central bank digital currency, in our case a digital euro, would uh, combine the two. It would be electronic but accessible uh, to, to everyone. Okay, and it's sort of in the context of this rapid digitalization and people using electronic means of payment more often. But with the difference that you're getting access directly to so-called central bank money, we see a lot um, whenever we issue a report on the dig digital euro or wherever, or, or we talk about this subject, we get lots of comments from people who are supporters of Bitcoin uh, and other crypto assets. Now, we already did a whole episode on that, of course, um, which you're welcome to go back and listen to. But I, I think what's maybe interesting here is how do we answer the question, well, if there are these other things out there like Bitcoin or Libra, why do central banks need to get involved and, and where do you see the difference there? Before talking about Bitcoin and Libra, um, let me come back to what you mentioned beforehand, that people indeed pay more and more electronically. No? And it, it's a clear trend that has been accelerated in recent years and uh, even accelerated somewhat more uh, with the COVID crisis. And, and why, wh why is that so? So obviously electronic payments are convenient. You know, you don't have uh, coins, you don't have change, you don't have to go to an ATM and withdraw banknotes. And then there have been lots of technological advancements in recent years uh, which made it even more convenient to pay electronically. For instance, contactless payments without a PIN code has recently been uh, increased uh, to a ceiling of 50 euro and uh, biometric recognition allowing for contactless payments uh, with mobile phones is of uh, fantastic convenience. No? So while on the banknote side you could say the technology hasn't changed for hundreds of years, you know, if you pay with the banknotes it's, it's still the same as, as if it was long time ago. So it's a bit an imbalance. One you know, becomes more and more convenient, the other stays always the same. Mm -hmm. That uh, naturally leads to a higher use of what is progressing. And of course, also for e-commerce, you cannot use uh, banknotes. So all of that uh, creates a trend to electronic payments. And then you mentioned um, crypto assets such as uh, Bitcoins and then also Libra, which is a bit different. But uh, Bitcoins is not really, you know, we would say it's not money. It's, uh, it's uh, fluctuating in its value. Uh, it is more like a commodity, you know, it's, it fluctuates like oil or yeah. gold. Yeah. Um, and it's not very trustworthy, maybe. I mean, some like it. Some like the idea that it has no central authority or no private issue or responsible for it. Some like it. Others may say uh, this is a bit, uh, you know, special and I don't want it. And it's not regulated anyway. So y let's say the risk is really for the user. Public authorities have no responsibility there. And Libra is a bit different. I mean, first, Libra is uh, just a project for the moment. Uh, it doesn't exist yet. I think it is more similar at the end to commercial bank money because it contains uh, a promise of convertibility into s central bank money. It's not so different from commercial bank money, but it tries to avoid the definition. And so it is still quite unclear what it is exactly. And uh, regulation of it is still unclear. So and, and it's the future, you know, nobody has yet uh, paid with Libra. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so um, I d I'm, I'm very happy actually paying um personally with my uh, card or my watch or my phone. I'm delighted recently to discover that my bakery will finally accept the watch as a payment uh, method, um, despite years uh, demanding only banknotes. Um, and that's a bit also driven by the coronavirus pandemic, isn't it? Has changed some of these payment styles. Even in Germany. It has changed, even yeah. even here in Germany, exactly. Um, <laughs> so so, we, so this, the change is really genuinely happening. In fact, when I told someone about that recently, they just didn't believe me that it was true. Um, and I said I maybe should take a picture of it, but I haven't done that. Um, but the, qu the question is, so if I'm comfortable using my um, these commercial money solutions to do that, w what's, what's, the, what's interesting about um, a, a digital euro? What would the benefits be or what are the different aspects that that brings? I mean, all central banks, including the ECB, have explicitly said they will continue issuing banknotes um, without time limitation. But nevertheless, usability of banknotes may at the end disappear because shops no longer want to accept them and most you know, customers also don't want to use them. 
So in that case, um, people would have to rely fully on digital payments. And the payment industry is a network industry in which uh, economies of scale imply that there will be always a high degree of concentration and of market power. So the payment market easily ends as an oligopoly or monopoly even. And that means that dominant players can set high prices at the end, competition is missing. And here the continuation of available central bank money for usage and payments would mean an outside option uh, for citizens, for customers, which also put a constraint on the potential use of market power by those uh, private companies which easily dominate uh, the payment market. To add one thing, in, in Europe, in addition, we have the issue that the largest players are all um, foreign companies or subsidiaries of foreign companies. And uh, if we look at the trend, they are further expanding market, market share. And in a certain way, you know, payment is a strategically important economic function. And it's not ideal, maybe, that this is in the hands of a few you know, foreign or subsidiaries of foreign companies. It just adds vulnerability for, for Europe, which uh, again speaks maybe in for maintaining an outside option, maintaining a means of payment, a universal one, for which we have a European monetary sovereignty also as a fallback solution. Mm -hmm. So it's about so it's about adding adi adding an option. It's about not taking it's not taking anything away. It's not taking away banknotes, it's not taking away these private solutions, but it's offering something else and it, and it's a public solution and it's homegrown as it were. Exactly. I mean it, it's not to take away let's say the uh, the role of the the private sector. I think the private sector has uh, offered, you know, again very convenient impressive uh, electronic payment solutions. And the private sector will continue to play a very important role and commercial bank money is there to stay. Yeah. Okay, okay. So going back to my um, hypothetical visit to the bakery, um, where I'm currently over enthusiastically using my watch, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would it look like with a digital euro? What, how would I, what would I do? Yeah, I mean, already now, you know, you may have different electronic payment solutions now that you could use in principle there. So then there will be an additional one and uh, you will decide, you know, on the basis of convenience or whatever comes to your mind, which one uh, you want to use. You know, one reason you might want to use uh, um, the digital euro could also be privacy. You know, if you don't like the idea that um, private uh, solutions could use your payment data for, you know, customizing uh, advertisements or whatever, you know, the digital euro would aim at or would guarantee to not use uh, your payment data. But I think you can imagine it, you know, being one payment solution, maybe you will have different payment apps on your mobile and um, the digital euro app uh, could be one of them or it could be even integrated into private payment solutions that you could switch from between commercial bank money and, uh, and central bank money all that we have still to explore. Okay, very interesting. We've talked about the positive aspects then, so some of the advantages. Um, wh what if I get super enthusiastic and decide, well, um, I like the sound of this, it's central bank money. I, I, I've never heard of a central bank um, going out of business. Why don't I put get rid of my bank account and have all my money uh, in central bank digital currency and in a digital euro? Would that work? But I don't think that this would be a good uh, a good choice really because we don't aim at uh, substituting the private sector with all, let's say, its service offers and innovative uh, power. So my guess would be the private sector will remain, you know, much broader in its services and, uh, and more efficient maybe. So digital euro should, um, you know, provide basic payment functions and there it should be good, it should be uh, as convenient as private solutions, but I don't think we will offer you know a lot of value-added services that you have with your with your bank account, um, like I don't know, possibility to purchase securities or possibility to convert into other currencies or you know regular uh, transfers of money or direct debits. I mean to be seen, 
but uh, there's no ambition, let's say, of central banks in general to uh, to offer all those services because the private sector, you know, it's a lot of work to offer them. There's a, a lot of work to uh, be in touch with clients when things go wrong and so on. So we also have the idea to rely on the private sector for the front end and for managing customer relations. So banks have all those customer relations anyway. They do uh, due diligence, uh, identifying their customers, doing uh, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing. All those things are done by the banking system, and it's you know huge workload. A lot of people are working on that. So it would be really efficient to uh, to recycle this work and maybe to put the front end in the hands of uh, of regulated entities uh, like banks to not uh, replicate everything. And that's again an argument in favor of uh, not expecting that the banks will lose business or other payment providers will lose business because it will be very reasonable to, to rely on them. Okay, so so as you say, I'm, I'm probably still going to need my bank account for all the things I need the bank account for today, like making payments, transfers, receiving my, my salary, um, that kind of thing, paying rent. And also it's wide open what the design of, of the digital euro is. And one possible answer is that it's it's a sort of back end and, and banks still provide a front end. I mean, can you talk us through a bit more some of the design choices that would have to be made here? Yeah, no, the, the back end technical solution is, of course, a big topic. And we have uh, started to think through it and if you if you read about central bank digital currencies in general people tend to mention two basic approaches one is a central ledger so a central system of accounts in which you would book um, every transaction and you would record there all the positions of all the holders of digital euro um, that's a, let's say the traditional approach all the private digital payment solutions are in a certain way based on central ledgers. No, on the other side, what is uh, mentioned often and often people believe that this comes naturally with central bank digital currency is a DLT, distributed ledger technology, which is uh, also what is behind Bitcoin actually in some sense. So there, the idea is that it's a decentralized system without a central book. And I mean, all those things are, are very fascinating and we are working on them. My personal intuition here is uh, that the traditional central ledger technology and the idea of online-based payments is, uh, is a more obvious one also for a digital euro because it's well tested, it is used for all the commercial bank payments uh, today. So the necessity to come, you know, also with a major innovation on the technological side is uh, is to be seen, no? Okay, very interesting. Um, and just to take a, a wider step back for a second, I mean, wh where do we sit sort of in international comparison terms? I mean, we're talking about the digital euro here, um, but what sort of things are happening in, in other countries and jurisdictions? Yeah, a lot of central banks are looking into into CBDC, central bank digital currency, 80% of central banks worldwide are engaged in CBDC uh, work and uh, also you know other big central banks like the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the People's Bank of China and so on. And the People's Bank of China is actually um, the most advanced of those uh, large central banks. So it has already deployed you know large uh, scale experimentation. So it is soon to be able, as I understand, to really issue um, a digital currency uh, for users. And the ECB maybe is a bit in the middle field here of uh, central banks. And one reason why we are not such a front runner may be that the euro area is still relying heavily on banknotes. There are differences between euro area countries, but on average that's a fair statement. And also we have a well-functioning banking system, so also commercial bank money and private electronic payment solutions are working pretty fine. So from this perspective, there was no urgency to uh, now launch uh, this project. 
in the meantime, when you see the trends in electronic payments, um, you come maybe to different conclusions that now it is time to look into this, to be prepared, um, to be able to decide at some stage to issue digital euro, even if currently still maybe there's no acute need to do so. Okay, and so um, going back to the digital euro then, wh wh what are the next steps? Um, wh when will this be ready? Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's a big, big question. <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah, the, um, I mean, so far the um, ECB has uh, issued its report, as you mentioned, on 2nd of October. It was the first uh, comprehensive official statement, you could say, of the ECB, how it sees uh, the topic of a digital euro. But um, but the next step would be likely, you know, to decide to go for a real project. And that could be done maybe mid of next year. Um, and this decision to go for a project would not be a decision to issue a digital euro, but uh, to really advance towards being able to do so, because uh, such large projects take uh, typically, you know, a few years. They can take three, four, five years. So um, if we are forward looking, we extrapolate trends, then, you know, if we want to be prepared to really decide to issue and to issue in a few years, then we should launch uh, such a project. In the meantime, we have uh, launched uh, our public consultation um, that came out on 12th of October. It's on our website. And we'll, so we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Yeah, um, how yeah. long does that stay open for? That's for three months, so it goes until 11th of January uh, next year. So there's enough time for everybody to look at it. And it's really addressed uh, not only to academia, the financial sector, or public authorities, really to everyone. So you will find questions that are more suitable maybe for one group than for the other. But in principle, everybody can you know answer to all uh, questions. We would, of course, hope uh, for learning about their needs, you know, what value added they would see from a digital euro, what um, front end solution they would uh, expect, you know, what they find most convenient in currently existing private digital payment solutions so that we can learn how to design this to be really in the interest and be in demand of citizens. Okay, so as long as you're listening to this podcast before the 11th of January 2021, we absolutely would like to hear your views. Ulrich, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's very interesting and, and, and good luck with the, uh, the input from the consultation and all the work around it. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It was a pleasure. That brings us to the end of this episode. So we've heard that while the ECB needs to be prepared for the event that a digital euro is needed, the plans are still at a fairly early stage and no decision has been taken yet. Uh, on the contrary, we're actually asking you to give feedback on a possible digital euro in the public consultation that we mentioned. Um, you can search online for digital euro and ECB, and as I said, we'll put something in the show notes. I thank again Ulrich Binsel for joining the conversation and giving us his insights. Uh, do also look in the show notes for other links to related papers and publications from the ECB. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts for future episodes via social media. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please do subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.